Good morning, good morning. Let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to praise you and I thank you so much for these prophecies that you give us of uh, through the uh, uh, different ways that you tie the Bible together and make it so as one complete package. It's, it's amazing to me that uh, anyone who would believe that uh, the Bible is not uh, inspired by you completely because of these little these little things in the in the entire Bible, many 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 years apart, they just tie everything together. And we want to praise you and thank you so much for all these hidden little secrets. We can find them out and dig them out, and it uh, and bring us joy to know that uh, your hand is upon it. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. I say that because this is a fascinating story. Uh, Jesus himself actually actually was, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit as we talk through this portion of Luke, that uh, Jesus expected them to know the day that he was going to arrive uh, and present himself as the king coming into the uh, temple area. Uh, and it was uh, the triumphal entry. We know it better as Palm Sunday because uh, uh, typically whenever a king or a visiting uh, a ruler would visit a town, people would turn out and uh, really roll out the red carpet for him, as we would call it these days. And so that's basically what the, the true believers of Christ did during the triumphal entry. And we celebrate every year on Palm Sunday. I remember uh, typically in uh, school that maybe the teachers would pass out palm branches if you could get a hold of them. Living in Arizona, that's fairly easy to do. No, they're all over the place. <laughs> but uh, the uh, they would lay them on the street, kind of like a red carpet, uh, or they'd lay their clothes or uh, stuff. So that uh, as the king was entering into the uh, into the uh, city, you're honoring him and you're praising him. Uh, and, and no different for the King Jesus. This is the one day he allowed this to happen. And it was because it was a prophecy that goes all the way back, back to Daniel 9. And as we get into our study in Daniel more, it's a couple of chapters away. Uh, we'll be studying this even deeper, but I thought I'd bring a, at least a little bit of it so you understand that the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem was planned uh, about, uh, oh, let's see, 100, uh, 445 BC, about a, a 477 years prior to when Jesus did it. And so uh, I get this little chart up here, but as we go through Luke, uh, you can kind of uh, notice what I'm talking about. And the... Uh, there's still a little controversy over the exact year. Uh, it's, and it's based mostly on, because unfortunately that date of 445 BC uh, is from secular history. And as people like to argue about that. And when you ca and also how to calculate it out. But we're talking uh, within, a, within a couple of years. Plus it has to do with when people believe Jesus was born. So I could, uh, that April 6th of 32 AD, I've seen it anywhere from 29 AD to 33 AD. Uh, and that's all based on when Jesus was born because it, uh, we know that he started his ministry at 30 years old and it went for about two and a half, three years. So if you go with the idea that he was born in 4 BC, that would put him about, 20, uh, about uh, uh, 26 AD when he started his ministry and he finished up about 29 AD. So that's where a lot of this thing happens. I think this is an actually accurate uh, number that I have here uh, that it happened when he was uh, in 32 AD. And there's, uh, and there's good reason. So that would mean that, that Jesus was actually born right around either 1 BC or right on uh, 1 AD. Uh, so there is no zero, year zero. And, that's, and that was the whole reason that the calendar changed at 1 AD. Because uh, BC stand, used to stand for uh, before Christ. It still does in my mind. Now they've changed it to BCE. Is, and they changed it to mean common era. And uh, uh, so BCE stands for before common era. And they've changed AD to CE to mean common era. Uh, that's because people don't want to believe that Jesus Christ actually existed. But for thousands of years, uh, that it was always called 
AD and BC. That's how I grew up on it. AD has a word it's called Alta Demetrius, something like that. And I think it was Latin for uh, 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 after Christ or something along that lines. But anyways, enough of that uh, particular history lesson. And let's get into Luke. And you haven't even seen the chart yet. There's the chart I've been talking about. So I'm not going to get deep into the chart. We will when we get into Daniel uh, and a little bit here. Uh, but mainly this is a Luke study. And so uh, we're going to be primarily, but I am going to bring in enough to show you uh, I just realized I brought up the wrong. So I am going to speak a little bit about uh, <clears throat> this particular event uh, is actually in all four Gospels. So I'm going to uh, mention a few things before we actually get to Luke. And of interest, and this is what I'm going to show you, of interest is to see how each gospel presents him a different way. Uh, so again, it comes into all four gospels, and it's interesting to see the four gospels and how they're written. They're written from the standpoint of uh, four, the four different, uh, four different part things about Jesus that made him special. And we got to realize that Jesus was uh, born a Jew. Uh, he was Jewish and that uh, he was br uh, brought into the Jewish nation uh, to someday sit on the throne of King David, who was also a Jew. So Matthew presents him as the uh, future king and ruler of uh, Israel. Mark uh, portrays him as a priest. Luke as a prophet, uh, and that's what we're going to be studying mostly, and then uh, John as the son of God. Uh, I'll just mention Mark. I mentioned the priest. Priests, believe it or not, are considered servants. So that's the other thing about uh, Mark is, is he's presented as a servant. This is the only one that doesn't have a genealogy in it because ge the servants don't have a genealogy typically. So let's take a look at these four uh, aspects of, and I start off in Matthew. Oh, I guess we got to change something from yesterday. Okay, fix that. Now I get the right reference. So Matthew, Matthew, like I said, uh, presents him as the King Jesus, and he's going to someday sit on David's throne, which he hasn't done yet. So that's an important aspect to remember that he uh, that, and that's why we believe the in the Millennium Kingdom, because that's when he's going to actually sit on David's throne as King of Israel, King of the world, actually. But in Matthew 21, 5, tell ye the daughter of Sion, uh, behold, the king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass, a colt and the foal of an ass. Uh, this is the uh, triumphal entry we're going to be talking about. And I had mentioned that uh, it's in all three gospels. Maybe I should uh, mention what the three gospels are. It's Matthew 21. I thought I wrote them on here. Oh yeah, Matthew 21, 1 through 11, Mark 11, 1 through 11, of course Luke 19, 29 through 40, and John 12, 12 through 19. So if you want to put those in your notes. Back to Matthew, and also over in Matthew 21, 12, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changes and the seats of them that sold doves. 
and said unto them, and listen very closely here, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. He acknowledges right here that, uh, that he is God uh, by saying that it's my house. Also in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, this is a famous verse. I've, I've said it so many times. It's on many Christmas cards. I think it's important to understand this verse too. For unto us a child is born. Okay, that's uh, Jesus came as a man, as a child, as a baby. Unto us a son is given. So who is he the son of? He is the son of God. And he is given to us as a perfect sacrifice. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Well, when has that happened? Hasn't happened yet. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth ever forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this is one of the original prophecies of Jesus way back uh, in Isaiah's time. That's like 900 BC, I think it is. I'm actually really seriously thinking about doing Isaiah next. Isaiah is a fascinating book. They call it the mini Bible because it's actually, uh, if you, when you study it, it's actually a condensed version of the entire Bible. It's 60, and it's even got the same number of chapters as it does books in the Bible. The 66 chapters. Uh, that's just, Realize the chapters are not inspired. Uh, they were written in there for in the, like the 1500s, I think it was, A.D. But uh, it's kind of interesting. They, uh, it correlates to the exact number of books in the Bible. So now let's go on to uh, uh, oh, in Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, the king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now we're talking about Mark. Mark, again, presents him as a servant and, and or as a priest. Uh, a priest is considered a servant to the people uh, and a, a servant of God. Uh, so that uh, you wouldn't know that by the Pharisees because they like to rule stuff. But over in Mark 11, 11, it mentions this. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. The reason I point to this is that you notice where he went. He went into the temple. Or where the priests go? They go into the temple. And so that's an uh, uh, indication in Mark. So anyone I got from Mark for right now, maybe we'll find more once we get into the actual uh, uh, other parts of the, uh, if we have a study mark, that's for that, for that short. Then, of course, uh, Luke is a, as a prophet. And the interesting thing about, prophet, about Luke uh, mentioning the prophet, and Luke is a man. Uh, they wept over Jerusalem. Uh, so that's something that a man would do, Somebody, uh, something a human would do. Uh, he entered into the temple and taught and healed there. Uh, so that uh, uh, it shows him to be uh, prophets were teachers. And that, uh, so a couple of verses that points to this. Going to jump ahead in Luke a little bit to see one of these in Luke 19, 41 through 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto the peace, but now they are hid from their eyes. Now, this is what I was talking about, about knowing the time. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee around and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and the children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation he's going to have the, the temple destroyed that happens in 70 AD because they didn't know that he when he was supposed to come so that uh, this particular prophecy of Daniel was supposed to be known by them Jumping down to verse 47 and 48, and he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear them. So that, that's kind of indicative of a prophet. 
prophets are there to teach mainly. That's their main job is to teach about coming events. Now, of course, last but not least is John. And John uh, presents him as the son of God, his divine nature. And some people say, well, there's no genealogy in John. Well, actually there is. It's only two verses. <laughs> uh, it's uh, verse one and verse two. Uh, in the beginning was the word. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then you jump down to verse 14 and it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's uh, when you're the son of God, uh, your genealogy is you and then the son of God and then God. <laughs> That's it. So back to John talking about his, his forever kingdom. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees. This is the uh, uh, welcoming him in the city. And went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel who cometh in the name of the Lord. That's the, that's the verse there that tells us that they saw him as, as God. I was going to see one other verse uh, that talks about that too. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. For you're not daughter of Zion. Behold, the king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, uh, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and they that had done these things unto him. And uh, also over in John 1, 49, Nathan answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And of course, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm just pointing to verses that talk about the fact that, uh, that John wrote about Jesus being, uh, and his, being the son of God and his deity. And, and the real important thing here is why, why did he come in the first place? Uh, he came as our sacrificial lamb. This is spoken of by John the Baptist in John 1, and 36. The next day, John, this John here is John the Baptist, seeing Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Jumping down to verse 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So now to get, get into what we've been talking about uh, I just wanted to mention one other thing too that uh, about this particular time frame is that uh, I believe that this this happened either on Saturday or Sunday of the uh, of the Passion Week. So I believe the crucifixion probably happened on Wednesday, but it could have happened on Thursday. Uh, we know that they celebrate it on Friday typically, and they call it Good Friday. But there's no physical way of getting three days and three nights uh, in the grave, which we know that was the uh, that was the prophecy uh, going back forever and still and still be awake and still be out of the tomb by Sunday morning. So most likely the day would be Wednesday. So for and typically uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up now is it typically the lamb uh, was presented for inspection four days prior to the uh, to the slaughter and for him to be uh, to make it for Wednesday, that would mean that uh, he would have to be presented or come in to the city on Saturday. Uh, but the latest it could be is Thursday, so that means Sunday. So either one, Saturday or Sunday, is fine. Uh, but uh, And then some people could say, well, Saturday is the Sabbath. Uh, he wouldn't do anything on the Sabbath. Well, uh, he could, uh, there's certain things you're still allowed to do. You're still allowed to uh, walk. And all, all he really did is walk into the temple area, look around and leave again. That's all he did on the first day he was there. Uh, so he didn't really uh, uh, do anything wrong against the, uh, the Sabbath that I can see. I, just, I guess you could say riding on a donkey, uh, but that uh, they're allowed to travel a certain distance. And we know that he was staying uh, most likely in Bethany, which was considered a Sabbath day travel uh, to Jerusalem. So I think that even whether it was Saturday or Sunday, it wouldn't matter. 
But you can see that uh, if he if he really truly would have uh, been crucified Friday afternoon, well, you got Friday night, Saturday night, and that's it. That's only two nights, uh, and then and then uh, to get three days, even if you counted Friday as one of the days, and then Saturday as a full day, you can't count Sunday uh, as a full day because we know that Mary went to the tomb before daylight on Sunday morning and the tomb was already empty. So that's why I don't believe it could have happened on Friday. And just to show you that verse in, uh, John, uh, talking about, uh, uh, the, uh, Mary find, finding the tomb empty prior to sunrise. That was in John 20, uh, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, Magdalene uh, early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. So the stone was already away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter. Oh, let me show you. Then he runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre and we know not where they have laid him. So uh, the tomb was actually empty prior to daylight uh, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Uh, so that uh, that's why I don't believe it could have happened on Friday. And some of the others will say that, uh, that there's these verses that talk about the fact that they had to get Jesus into the uh, into the uh, grave prior to the Sabbath day starting. And because the Sabbath was starting at six o'clock that evening, uh, the day he died, uh, that uh, they, Joseph of Asamia and, uh, and, uh, and Nicodemus needed the body off the cross and to bury him before six o'clock because the Sabbath was the next day. And that would be uh, Saturday, uh, with Friday being that, that day they're talking about. But there are other high holy days and realize that Passover was that week also. Passover was considered another high holy day to where no work was done. So they could have been talking about Passover and that would push it back. And then plus the other, the other what they call a preparation day for Passover. And that was another high uh, day. So that could have been Thursday, and then Friday being uh, the Passover, and then the Sabbath on Saturday. So those are just some uh, ideas on uh, how I think it could have worked out. Just throw those out there. So anyways, back to Luke. We'll finally get to Luke, uh, starting in verse 29. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. Now I want to show you that this was a prophecy uh, by, uh, by Zechariah. Uh, Mount of Olives, uh, and Mount of Olives is a great significance point. I thought uh, I'd mention while we're here, Mount of Olives, is it, Whenever God comes and goes out of Jerusalem area, he seems to he always leave, he left uh, by via Mount of Olives way back uh, in Ezekiel's time frame. <clears throat> I think I get the verses for that because uh, it's kind of a long paragraph to, to go through to see when he left the temple. It was in, in, it's in chapter 10, but it's pretty much the whole chapter. And at a future date, he's going to return to set up his kingdom uh, through the Mount of Olives. So I found it interesting that Jesus came from the Mount of Olives here to uh, uh, to come into the city uh, for his sacrifice. Or his first coming, I should say. But I'll show you those uh, prophecies over in Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. And when he fought in the day of battle... And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it towards the south. That's still future. That's going to happen when Jesus returns at the second coming. Also in Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was offered once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time 
without sin unto salvation. So that's when he's going to be coming the second time. But he'll be appearing uh, without sin. This time he's uh, he's appearing uh, to uh, to take to bear the sins of many. Uh, so that's why I put that verse in there. Then uh, Daniel nine twenty five. And this is where the uh, uh, this this whole thing comes into play here. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. And here it is: the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. I didn't get my big point. I think you can see it. And it was a uh, dec it was a decree by Anaxerxes Logomaeus, and that happened on March fourteenth, four forty five B.C. Unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. When you add that up, it comes out to 69 weeks. 69 weeks of years. This is something when we get into Daniel, I'll spend a little time with. But there's, uh, there's actually verses that talk about. Uh, we always think of it. In the Hebrew culture, a week is any anything that's seven. Uh, seven of anything. It could be can be days, it can be weeks, can be months, can be years. Uh, and in this particular case, it happens to be years. It says it right in the uh, right in the uh, thing. Shall be seven weeks and three score in two weeks. So it even says it. So that's sixty nine weeks, and a week is being as a as a unit of seven. So you multiply sixty nine times seven, and you get three hundred and six uh, times three hundred and sixty day years. That's what that's what the Jewish year is. That comes out to 173,880 days. So if you go from 445 BC until 32 AD, add in the difference between March 14th to April 6th, Jesus' tri triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, which would have been about the right time frame because uh, 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 there's different dates that uh, that uh, the uh, <clears throat> the actual date that's set by uh, uh, for Passover is the 14th day of April. And if he came in on the 6th of April, that would put it about uh, eight days ahead of time, which fits into the time frame I just talked about uh, for his uh, crucifixion. So he basically got, was crucified the day before this, uh, uh, before the 14th or the 13th. So again, the timing works out pretty good. So that the uh, the accuracy is really accurate, and Jesus actually holds them accountable for that, knowing that. So even if it was a day off here or there, uh, I think that uh, they should have known the, the the proper time frame, and that he would be presenting himself uh, as the perfect Passover lamb. So it would be on Passover. So you can see that it was a it was a perfect match. Anyways, is what I'm driving at here. Uh, so this particular prophecy back in Daniel 9.25 uh, was right to the exact day that he came into the city on this uh, on the uh, donkey. And I thought I'd just show you where that uh, where it talks about that commandment to restore Jerusalem. That's in Nehemiah 2.1. You notice here in Nehemiah 2 that the Holy Spirit actually told him the exact date to make sure that that date is well known and it's written in Scripture. And it's also written in... Uh, the uh, other, other uh, like Josephus, other, other historians have wrote it also. Uh, this particular king was well known, and they have a, a time frame of when he was in power. So when we read Nehemiah 2.1, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, uh, which is April, I mean March, in the 20th year of Xerxes the king, so it tells what year that he was, uh, the, which year of his reign, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been bef before time sat in his presence. Uh, this is uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer for Axerxes. And Axerxes uh, had a lot of respect for Nehemiah. And, ne and so he was asking him why he felt sad. So we're going to jump down to verse 5. And Nehemiah here tells him why. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judea, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also was sitting by him, for how long shall the journey be and will will they return? So it pleased the king to send me and I set him a time uh, so that uh, uh, the king had gave him permission on this date in 445 BC 
the 445 BC came from the records uh, that I talked about, uh, and that's when uh, it would have been the 20th year of Anaxerxes' uh, reign. So that's where we got that number from. And, and it, it told us the exact date right in the uh, scripture there in verse 1, the 14th day of Nisan. So when you, when you work out the map, it actually comes out to the exact day spoken of by Daniel. So this is the reason Jesus, what he said in verses 42 through 44, which we'll get into tomorrow, uh, those verses there. And I think I actually read them earlier. I think I read, uh, yeah, I read them earlier, Luke, uh, verse 42 and 44. I can read them again. Uh, well, right at 30 minutes. So let me finish up here. And again, it's also in Zechariah 9, 9. It mentions that. I already read that once too, uh, that he's going to be coming in. So another prophecy that he's going to be coming in. So they should have been expecting him is what I'm basically driving at. So on to verse 30, saying, so the, continuing on, this is Jesus speaking, saying, go ye into the village over against you, in which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereupon yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you lose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the coat, the owners thereof said unto him, why loose ye the coat? And they said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and they cast their garments upon the coat and they set Jesus thereupon. As he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the de descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So some verses that uh, talk about blessings over in Psalms 118, 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Uh, talking about being a king over in Matthew 2, 2. Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. I love that verse because I truly believe that uh, the reason these, uh, that's the three wise men, knew that uh, this king was going to be born was again because of this prophecy uh, of Daniel. And I truly believe that Daniel had set in motion uh, these kings who had come from the east. Remember that Babylon is east of uh, Jerusalem. So that uh, it, made, it made a lot of sense to me that the reason they knew this was because of this prophecy. <clears throat> also in John 5.43, talking about name. I come in my father's name and you receive me not. If I, if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. That's a little poke at the fact that the, when the Antichrist comes, they're going to believe the, him to be the Messiah, even though he's not going to come with the right name. And talking about peace over in Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So back to Luke 19.39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Well, the reason they want to rebuke them is because uh, the, the Pharisees know that uh, uh, by calling Jesus uh, Hosanna in the highest, uh, that they're basically saying that Jesus is God, that he's the Messiah. And again, the Pharisees still were not convinced that the Messiah, and they should have known better, uh, that, that, that Jesus was the Messiah. Because it was he was due on that day, and the Pharisees studied all these Old Testament verses and should have known, should have been looking for it. Verse forty, and he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And that's all. And that particular thing is over in Habakkuk uh, two eleven, for the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Uh, so that's uh, what Jesus was referring to here, uh, is that uh, the actual stones uh, know that he's God. 
that's kind of another uh, poke at the fact that they should have known who he was. So I'm going to stop there for today and we'll continue on with this, uh, uh, him coming into the triumphal entry tomorrow. And so I, I hope that was a blessing and it, uh, we'll get, and we'll continue to uh, look at this passage tomorrow when we look into the uh, actual, uh, uh, what he does when he comes into uh, in, in Jerusalem that day uh, from the standpoint of the three like I mentioned, the three Gospels. You'll notice he'll do three different things. Uh, one uh, is going to have to do with the fact he looked around in the temple and there was nothing as a priest. And there's another one that's going to kind of point to the fact that he's going to uh, go and get rid of the money changes. Uh, that's another, another way of confirming the different days too, which I'll point out because on Saturday, there would have been no work being done uh, at the temple. Uh, so that's why when Jesus went in, nothing was going on there and he left again. With the next day, Sunday, uh, he went in and found the money changes, uh, getting ready for the Passover uh, to selling their stuff. Uh, and so uh, that's indicative of the day that they were presenting their sacrifices to the temple or four days ahead of the actual uh, crucifixion, uh, four days ahead of Passover. So. Neat stuff. And uh, I'll talk again tomorrow. Let's stay, end with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for the things you've shown me on this lesson, uh, that uh, the different aspects and the different uh, approaches of your triumphal entry into Jerusalem and how accurate they, uh, the prophecies of Daniel were. And so I praise you and I thank you for all this information that just confirms all the things that uh, just make it so wonderful to uh, know that uh, that you are the uh, the one and only savior of the world and that you are our sacrificial lamb. And we look forward to serving you uh, both now and forever. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. So I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Have a great day.